Hey everybody, it's the Commodore from the Clan of the Grey Wolf and you're watching the weekly ringer series here on clanofthegreywolf.com. Now you've actually caught me in the middle of a bit of a pensive moment as it's a very sad day here at clanofthegreywolf.com. All very saddened by the news that Steve Jobs has died. Um, I feel almost guilty in some ways of asking that question. Uh, maybe not guilty is, is not the right word, but of asking the question about Steve Jobs that we worked uh, so hard on a few weeks ago because it would have been a great question to ask this week. But suffice it to say that we're all very saddened by the news of Steve's passing, obviously. But also we want to extend uh, our thoughts and prayers to all of the family and all of us that have been touched by Steve Jobs and the many contributions he has made uh, to the world to this point. So. Um, Starting on a little bit of a sad note, but that's okay. No matter what the news happens to be that week, the Weekly Ringer presses on, and thusly here I am. I think the new cadence is going very well. I like the idea, as many of you do, of, having, of giving you the weekend to think about things. So I'm going to continue with this schedule, and it works very, very well. So, um, yeah, so what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about wrapping up that question from last week about first-person shooters. And as I always do, I'm going to run through some of the contributions for the community I thought were really, really good. I'm going to go through and give you my opinion, as I always do. Probably throw in a couple wild cards, a couple, um, maybe, maybe some, some uh, elements that didn't maybe answer the question, but were worth noting at the same time. And uh, then I'm going to ask you a question about probably what some of your favorite fantasy universes look like uh, to wrap things up. So, Let's get right down to it, shall we? Last week, I was talking about the idea of the build-up to the new id game, Rage. Now, uh, it's come out, and I've read some reviews, and I have to say they are underwhelming. It seems like, if for those of us that were really, really excited about Rage being carrying on the vision of id, and really the prominence of id coming back to the forefront, looks like Rage is not going to be it, and that's unfortunate. Now, I haven't played it yet, and I would like to get my hands on it before um, I make that final determination, but I definitely did see it at PAX East, and it was, I think, um, an interesting thing to think about. Um, you know, a lot of different concepts going into what makes Rage what it is, but I think it kind of doesn't quite get there. So, um, that's the bad news. However, the question that I asked coming off of the build-up and anticipation for Rage was which is the most, I guess, groundbreaking first-person shooter? So many answers. I'm not even going to say that any of them are necessarily right or wrong, but for many very good reasons, a lot of them were included. The first one I want to mention, and for, for all these and, and every Weekly Ringer, guys, I don't mention maybe who had the best point of it. Sometimes I just mention mostly... Um, who mentioned it first? So don't be offended if you mention something and you don't get a, a shout out. Temmie John started off uh, everything with the mention of Quake. Um, some of the reasons that were given, and I think Quake is a very good uh, entrant here, is because of the real 3D feel to it. Yes, Doom had three dimensions, much more than say something like a Wolfenstein. But uh, Quake Quake addressed some of the issues of Doom. So if you're moving around in Doom, you'll notice that when the reticle focuses in the center of the screen, you pull the trigger and it will shoot someone up here as well as someone down there. It has to. It's the only way they could really build out the 3D without having to have full three-dimensional look, which the um, id tech engine at that time didn't have that capability. Quake changed all of that. And I remember in the mid-90s playing Quake and thinking, my goodness, that is absolutely beautiful. And thinking really that uh, they had tremendously redefined the genre. So I think Quake is a very good suggestion. Um, there were a lot of things that came from Quake. First of all, I love the idea of the inclusion of the Nine Inch Nails Trent Reznor um, music. I think that was uh, substantial. And Quake really did continue to be as visceral as some of the Doom games were. And it really helped to continue that tradition um, of id Software, which is to have this really visceral, very vicious kind of first person shooter. So I think it did break a lot of ground. Um, it also helped to, tr to, to define better how we can actually host server-based multiplayer. Great, great contribution of Quake and its progeny. Um, and for that reason, I think Quake belongs on the list. Mr. K mentioned Goldeneye, and although I think Astolia and, and a few others disparage it later on, I have to say Goldeneye belongs on this list. Um, 
I don't even think there's any question about it, guys. And the reason why is because GoldenEye took the, the first-person shooter from being a, only a PC-based genre and took it in any kind of real way and made it into a, a, a console-based genre that was realistic in any way. It was very deep. It had... It was one of the best movie licensed titles of all time. It followed the film perfectly, and it really, I think, got you in, in the James Bond and the film better than the film did. And I, and I love GoldenEye. It's one of my favorite James Bond movies of all time. But the license on GoldenEye, the game for N64, was tremendous, and I think there's no arguing that point. But GoldenEye made it possible to be a first-person shooter on the consoles and it did it well and it had different multiple control schemes a la the way we work on a PC and I just thought the execution was was just flawless on it playing it now obviously doesn't age well and that's you know a different argument altogether you can play Quake right now just as much as you could have played it the first day it came out it might not look as pretty but I have to say GoldenEye is almost unplayable at this point the way that we enjoy control with our games now but that's not the question the question was which is the most groundbreaking and in that case GoldenEye absolutely deserves to be on the list. DTX 180 mentioned Doom. Doom is the quintessential favorite in this category. Why? Not because it was the first first-person shooter, but some would argue because it's the first first-person shooter to do it right. Um, sure, Wolfenstein 3D creates the genre. Um, Wolfenstein 3D was awesome. It was a lot of fun. But Doom made Wolfenstein 3D look like a kid's game. And Doom did everything right. It had the kind of um, pre-rendered uh, hand that had all the different motions, which looked just so real back then in all of its highly pixelated glory. Um, you had the position of the pistol and everything else, which took from Wolfenstein, but it all looked real. It had so much greater depth to it than anything Wolfenstein had in terms of the position of the hand and everything else. Also, there were so many great moments in Doom where they would really set you up in, in tremendous ways that were cinematic, even though they didn't have any kind of cutscenes or, or real cinematography to them at all. As in, you walk into a room, you'd step on something, all these doors would go up, all these other doors would go down, and all of a sudden you were in a shitload of trouble. That is, uh, that's Doom. Plus, let's, let's not ignore the fact that Doom looked gorgeous for the time. And it was the first game, and not just because it looked gorgeous, there are a lot of games that looked gorgeous over the time. This game looked gorgeous in an era when other things did not. And that's why Doom really took on the caliber that it did. And lest we forget, one of the other huge contributions of Doom is that it was a shareware game and really, I think, spread the phenomenon of shareware in the early to mid-90s. Something that... Um, that was only really available for smaller titles, titles that didn't weren't really AAA kinds of titles the way that Doom was. And once you started playing Doom and you started playing Doom 2, it just it just changed everything. So in terms of being groundbreaking, I don't think there's any argument that Doom belongs on that list, if not number one. Lenoir uh, mentioned uh, two that I want to talk about. One was Half Life. This is a point of, of tremendous harping from me. Um, Half-Life is superb and sublime. It is one of those games that is so tightly wrapped in a package it's almost impossible to break. It really sets Valve up as the great, one of the greatest developers in the world, if not the greatest. Half-Life is a perfect package. More so than Quake, more so than Doom, Half-Life is in itself a completely groundbreaking, fundamentally different experiences that change everything that comes after it. Um, not saying that Doom and Quake don't do that too, they absolutely do, but, uh, but Half-Life was simply jaw-dropping for more reasons than the game itself was awesome. It was jaw-dropping because it was the cinematic experience played out on your PC without cutscenes everything just kept going as if you were living this one long narrative of chapters there wasn't a this level is over now we start this level it was so much better than that such a great experience and half-life i will never forget half-life did something with its the opening of half-life i can watch that right now if you have half-life and you go and you watch the opening scene 
where, where Gordon Freeman gets on the tram to go to work like he does every single day, and you're slowly getting into the office, and there's that kind of environment. That is one of the greatest kind of gripping, pull you in, suck you into the experience kinds of moments that I think you could argue is one of the best moments from first-person shooters ever, right there with the, the first moments of Bioshock, which is a, a game I will mention in just a little bit as well. So um, the, other, the other game that Lenoir mentioned was Star Siege Tribes, and I have to give mad props for that, guys. Star Siege Tribes was a game on a completely different level. Star Siege Tribes was also interesting in that there really was no single player component. It was only a multiplayer game. Half-Life is good because it is a fantastic single player experience. Tribes is good because it is only a tremendous multiplayer experience. Tribes with the jetpack, with the way that it allows you to float through massive, massive environments. And by the way, it happened right in between when they were developing. So it, it launched as just a software, um, no fully 3D, and then became fully 3D with patches later on and with 3D rendering becoming what it was. And it became a 3D game and it just looked fantastic once they got it into 3D. But you could play that game in 2D and it is just stellar and superb. I love, love, love Tribes, and it will be forever one of the games that I spent the most time playing in my life, and was just beautiful and gorgeous, and has so many contributions up and above even what I've mentioned here, um, even just down to the, to the way that you could curse at your teammates without having to curse, something all of us, I think, would love to have when we got on Xbox Live by the time we uh, start playing with 12-year-olds that are cursing us out. Um, let's see... Shrimpy Man, who is new to the, um, to the community this week, a welcomed contribution with Halo. Halo is absolutely one of the best of the genre and broke ground in so many different ways. First of all, Halo might be seen as, the, as, as some of the perfection of form, at least for the, the Xbox generation, of the Half-Life formula which might also be the perfection of uh, something else that I'll mention in just a moment. But Halo is the, the case in point that GoldenEye is, illustrates. You can play a first-person shooter on a console, and it will be not only good, but it could even be better than, than many PC experiences. Halo does that for me. It is absolutely a first-person experience that sucks you into a story that I am still into today. I love reading the Halo books. All of, and the rumored Halo movie, by the way, which uh, uh, details actually emerged this week that there might be a Halo movie in production that's been very, very, very quiet um, with Steven Spielberg and DreamWorks that will actually follow the book narratives up and above following the game narrative, which I think is fantastic because the book narrative is just tremendous. Not to say that the, the game suffered, but the book is tremendous. Um, so Halo deserves to be on that uh, list. It not only perfected the form of, of what a... Uh, first-person shooter would look like on a console, but it also did it in a way that really pulled you into a story that was second to none, and it, it introduced a lot of really cool elements. Some of the things that they did in terms of the shield regeneration, some of the things they did in terms of the UI and the HUD display, I think are copied all the time in every first-person shooter that's come after it, bar none. And so I think Halo with Bungie um, deserves to be on that list. And now I want to get into something else where uh, Astolia mentioned the classic, classic game, System Shock. Now, I wasn't alluding to this with the Bioshock game uh, or book that I began last week's ringer about or with. But um, so no, no, no conspiracy theories there. I really was just uh, uh, showing you guys the, the, the new book I've got that I was excited about. System Shock might be the winner this week. System Shock is tremendous because before Half-Life was Half-Life, System Shock was System Shock. And any of you that know anything about it, and I think Estolia made this point very, very well, System Shock is, Half-Life becomes kind of the perfection of form of System Shock and not the other way around. System Shock is a beautiful game. It, it, it brings you into a movie. It is a narrative that is so well told and it is so incredible. It's got, it's got survival horror elements, which Half-Life then utilizes as well. It's got so many elements of a, a real narrative, and it was a narrative first that a game can tell that story the way that Half-Life worked. And I'm telling you, 
it is the way that Ken Levine and, and the rest of everybody that of what would become the offshoot of Irrational Games created a